Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. Today, we're going to talk about Bitcoin. Dubious speculation. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and also check out the sale on Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. Let's go ahead and jump in. So I'm just going to go through a couple of different scenarios here for Bitcoin, um, and hopefully it is insightful to anyone watching this video. And of course, at any time, there's always sort of the more optimistic view, the more pessimistic view. We're going to, to attempt to go through each one and uh, to provide evidence for each one. So the first thing we should do is take some inventory on where we are within the current cycle, if you believe right in cycle theory to begin with. And one of the things we can do is we can look at, say, the ROI or return on investment of Bitcoin as measured from the 2022 low, compare that to the 2014 and 2018 lows and those respective cycles and see where we are against those two cycles. And if you do that, right, if you do that, you get the current cycle is this purple line. And then the last two cycles are the green line, the green line and the orange line. And if you look, you will see that in the current cycle, we are at a much higher level at this phase of the cycle than we were in the last two. But you can see that two cycles ago, we made this very move that we're getting now, but we made it just you know a month later or so. And then ultimately what happened is that you know, price sort of leveled out for a while after getting up into the into sort of this upper range, and then it continued to go up later on. So in some ways, we are ahead of where we were in the last two cycles. But again, that's not really out of the ordinary, right? We have seen that happen. We saw it happen last cycle. In fact, if you just compare the green line, which was last cycle to the cycle before it, the green line was ahead of the orange line, the cycle before it, on more than one occasion, right? Even fairly late cycle, it was still ahead of it. And it didn't really drop back down below it until somewhere between day 800 to 900. And then early on, right, we got ahead of, of what the prior cycle had accomplished. And so in that way, where we are right now is perfectly normal, right? It's perfectly normal. It's not really outside the ordinary. I mean, it is it is ahead of the last cycle, right? It's ahead of it. But we also saw that last cycle often went ahead of the cycle before that one. So in that way, things aren't really out of the ordinary, right? That's one way to look at it, okay? We can also look at it as measured from the peak, and extend that out. And if you look at that compared to the last two cycles, you will see that we are also ahead of where we were. And in fact, at this point in both prior cycles, right in the last two cycles, the ROI as measured from the peak for Bitcoin was at 0.37 in both prior cycles. 0.37, exactly, right? And currently we're at 0.92. It shows you in that way that we are a lot more extended than we have been in prior cycles at this same exact time. Some people have talked about a potential translated cycle peak, and that could be something to keep in mind if this trend continues, right? I don't know if it will, um, but if it does continue, I think that would be something to, to keep in mind. To give you an idea of, of, of where 0.37 would even be, right? 0.37 would represent a 63% drawdown from the all-time high. Now, a 63% drawdown from the all-time high is clearly a lot lower than where we currently are. In fact, from the all-time high, Bitcoin right now is only 9% below that, right? 63% below it would actually be all the way down at around 25K. So when you measure it from the peak, we are certainly ahead of where we were 
in prior cycles. But again, it's not really out of the ordinary. If you were looking at the last cycle, there was a time where we were far ahead of the cycle before that. And then it, it happened again later on in the cycle where we were far ahead of the cycle before that, right? So seeing it play out again here, again, it's not out of the ordinary because we saw something similar happen last cycle, right? So in that way, it's not really out of the ordinary, but it does go to show just how extended we are right from the from the from the last two cycles um it actually took right if we actually measure this out right we're currently on day 846 if we look at two cycles ago it took until day 1063 i mean you're talking about a whole extra year to get to this valuation from the peak and then or sorry last cycle that's what it took and then the cycle before that it took about over 1100 days to get to such a valuation, right? So it's important to keep that in mind, right? As measured from the low, we are extended a little bit, not that much. As measured from the peak, we are, right? And one thing that I, I've seen a lot of people talk about is, is it the same, right? Is retail interest the same as it was in 2021? Because, you know, if you look at, if you look at like Bitcoin price action and we see where we currently are, we are, we're back at the highs. And I've seen some people say, well, is it as crazy as it was back then from a, from a social standpoint, right? From like a, a retail point of view. And the answer is no, right? I mean, you know, there's a lot of data to suggest that while there is a lot of excitement in the space, there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, if you were to go look at, at social interest, right? Like YouTube views, we did a, re we did a video on this recently we're still nowhere near where we were in 2021, right? We're averaging these channels. I could get it, you know, I could change the channels up and, and get some of the newer ones that have been growing. But again, this just keeping with the same channels, right? We're averaging around 700,000 views a day. Back over here, it was in the millions, right? Two million a day, right? So three times more. If you were to look at followers to Twitter analysts that, you know, are crypto analysts on Twitter, I mean, you can see where we are today compared to where we were back over here, right? So this is an order of magnitude higher. I mean, like right here in 2021, these accounts were averaging around 40,000 new Twitter followers a day. And you can see right now they're averaging around 4,000 followers a day, right? That's an order of magnitude less, right? A full order of magnitude less. And so in that way, if, if we just look at it from, like, say, a, a retail point of view, it would lead us to believe that it's not, right? It's not the same type of mania that we saw in 2021, right? There's a lot less interest right now compared to 2021. And so then the question becomes, well, is this phase coming, right? Like, is this phase going to come or will it do something like 2019? Right. We'll do something like 2019 where social interest goes up, you know, as the price of Bitcoin goes up, but it doesn't, you know, retail never really comes. Right. The, the, the sort of the nebulous retail investors that are theoretically on their way, they don't really show up. And and again, it's really hard to say. I, I don't have a strong opinion on it. I, I wish I did. Even if I did, I don't know if, you know, it's not like you should take that to the bank or anything because I do get things wrong very frequently. Um, but I, I did think it was interesting just sort of like a, as an idea of like, is retail here in the same way as they were in 2021? And the answer is no. It, clearly the answer is no. But then the question becomes not whether they're here or not, because we can see it's, they're, they're, it's not nearly what it was in 2021. The answer then becomes, are they coming? Right? It, it's sort of, we have to shift the question away from are they here to are they coming? And that I think is where it gets a little bit less clear. There are certainly reasons to believe that they could be coming, right? There's spot ETF flows that everyone's talking about. I don't really talk about them that much, but I mean, everyone else talks about them. Um, we actually do have um, the, um, we, we do have some of the uh, ETF stuff on the website. Um, 
you know, under under some of these tabs where we track you know the various the, the various different like flows and whatnot or the 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 assets under management I should say uh, for the various ETFs. But at the end of the day, will that bring retail back in mass? And and again, I I, I don't fully know the answer to that question. I think we could come up with reasons either way. But what I would say is keep an eye on the social interest. You know, do we see it continue to pick up? If you go look at at Twitter followers to exchanges, right? They're still kind of, I mean, they're you know, they've been moving up and down a little bit, but not nothing, nothing crazy like back over here, right? In 2019, we we saw it sort of moving up and down a little bit, but nothing really that crazy. And so that's the question, right? Is it going to turn into this? Or is it going to just simply fade? Now, there's one metric that we can look at that we can use it to potentially try to provide insight. But what you'll find is that it gives an example either way, right? And so it's not going to necessarily clear things up, but I do want to at least show something that would say, hey, you know, if you're a bull, you're gonna find the evidence you're looking for or if you're a bear, you're going to find the evidence you're looking for, and that is through the lens of the ETH Bitcoin valuation. Now, if you are new to the channel, I, I will fill you in. I have been very bearish on the ETH Bitcoin valuation ever since the merge. In reality, I've been bearish really since right here, right? That's where I sold a lot of my ETH to Bitcoin um, and then we saw it collapse. I felt like a genius. And then it went right back up and it swept those highs, right? Like it swept the highs from where I thought it was a good time to trade from ETH to Bitcoin. And we rallied into the merge, right? We rallied into the merge. And then ever since then, it's been a series of lower highs and lower lows. My general view on the market as it relates to ETH Bitcoin is that ETH Bitcoin is going to the 0.03 to 0.04 range. Now, not everyone believes that, and I'm not necessarily asking you to believe it. That is my view that I've done entire videos on. And so if you're curious about why I think it's going down to 0.03 to 0.04, I would recommend watching those videos. But if you were to take the assumption that it's going to go to 0.03 to 0.04, right? If you were to say, hey, I don't believe Ben that it's going to go there. You know, he's too bearish on the ETH Bitcoin valuation. But let's just go through an exercise to say, what if he's right, right? He's, he might not be, and he's gotten wrong. He's, he's been wrong about these other things. But what if he is right about the ETH Bitcoin valuation going to the 0.03 to 0.04 range? Then what you do is you look at the last two times it had this same pattern where you, you basically have sort of like a peak, a lower peak, um, and again, the same thing over here, right? A peak and then a lower peak. You sort of set your low, right? You set your low right here in between these peaks. And then you come back down to that low after that second peak. And then you, you spend some time in this range, right? In this range before ultimately capitulating below it down to that level, right? And so my view is that the ETH Bitcoin valuation today is going through this exact same pattern where you get your first peak you set your low, you then get your second peak, you come back down into that low, then you spend some time just kind of hanging out in that range before ultimately it collapses down theoretically into the 0.03 to 0.04 range. So I think that ETH Bitcoin is going to 0.03 to 0.04. And I've been clear about that for, you know, a year, year and a half. So that's a long time. But look, I mean, the trend has been down, you know, whether the, uh, you know, whether you, you, you like ETH or not, um, whether you wanted to see the ETH Bitcoin valuation bleed or not, right? It's, it's a fact that it has been going down, right? I mean, that's just what's happened. And so that's the reality of the situation. And so then the question becomes, well, wait, hey, Ben, you said there's evidence for the bulls and evidence for the bears, right? You said there was evidence for both. So what is that evidence, right? Well, what's fascinating as it relates to ETH Bitcoin, is that you have two scenarios previously where ETH Bitcoin finally broke down. In the first scenario, right, in this scenario over here, 
Bitcoin went up even after ETH Bitcoin broke down, right? So if we were to overlay Bitcoin USD onto this chart, what you will notice is that Bitcoin went parabolic through that phase and continued to go up even after ETH Bitcoin like broke support and even after ETH Bitcoin found a bottom, right? Bitcoin still went parabolic throughout that entire phase. But in this case over here, Bitcoin USD topped when ETH Bitcoin broke support, right? So there's two clear examples, right? And and again, I mean, take your pick. If you're if you're bullish, you're going to look at 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 this example over here. If you're bearish, you're going to look at this example over here. And what's fascinating is I could provide even more evidence to, you know, to say that, hey, it's going to play out like either one. For instance, if I were to look at this rally over here by Bitcoin, one of the interesting things is that it, you know, it really, it, it first started out at around 200 to, to 250, right? Which is really similar to, you know, kind of this phase over here, right? That two, that two or 20,000 to 25,000 or so. And then it made a move up into the 400 range, right? And then we made a move up into the 40K range. And then we made a move up into the 600 range. And then we made a move up into the 60K range, right? And when ETH Bitcoin finally broke down right here, right? When it finally broke down, it was when Bitcoin rallied above $700, right? which coincidentally today would correspond to a new all-time high, right? If we were to hit 70K, right? So that is precisely where ETH Bitcoin broke down was where Bitcoin rallied above $700. But again, that back then did not correspond to a new all-time high, right? It was actually still, you know, 30, 40% below the all-time, maybe even more. I don't remember exactly to the, to the penny, but it maybe even below. And so you can see that, as Bitcoin broke through, ETH Bitcoin bottoms right here as Bitcoin hit about 900 to 1,000. So if Bitcoin were to break above the highs and rally up near six figures, that would be your analog that you could follow if you're, you know, if, if, it, if it's bullish, right? ETH Bitcoin breaks down, Bitcoin goes up. In this case over here, in the following case, it was completely different, right? And and you might say, well, what evidence is there to support that view, right? It's not just a 100x difference, right? In this case, right, in this case over here, Bitcoin was at 3,500 and then it went all the way to 14,000 or so. So what evidence is there? I mean, this is pretty loose evidence just to say, well, it's two orders of magnitude, right? Um, but it's kind of interesting, right? It's kind of interesting that, that the market has been working out in a very similar pattern. And I know a lot of people have been comparing the current cycle to 2015 to 2016. Do note that in 2015 to 2016, Bitcoin did come back down and sort of retest the breakout points, which is not something that has been happening this, you know, in this cycle so far, right? I mean, we haven't, we never went back down to test 30K after we broke out, after we broke out above it. So, that's some evidence, right? You can see that ETH Bitcoin collapsed as Bitcoin went parabolic from about 700 or 600 all the way up to 1,000. And it was sort of stepping stones, 200 to 400 to 600 to 1,000, right? 20K, 40K, 60K, et cetera. Then there's other evidence to say, well, what if it plays out like this one? Because in this case over here, when ETH Bitcoin broke down, you can see that Bitcoin USD topped. So which is it, right? Which is, you know, is it going to play out like that, where Bitcoin USD tops as ETH Bitcoin breaks down? Or will it play out like this, where ETH Bitcoin breaks down as Bitcoin continues to go up? Now, what evidence is, is there to suggest that it could be playing out like 2019 instead of, you know, instead of 2016? Well, I think the most compelling evidence would be things like, you know, gold potentially breaking out and 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 sort of being knocking on the door, likely of of rate cuts sometime this year, 
right? That would be the evidence that I think you could point to. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, um, if we were to if we were to pull up gold on the chart, it's it's funny because it actually happened to correspond to gold breaking out from these range highs. It wasn't all time highs, but they were the range highs. And you can see that as gold broke out from the range highs, Bitcoin topped like one week later, right? The reason why that's interesting is because gold, I mean, let me actually get this on a, on a sort of a, a lower time frame so you can actually see sort of where, where gold has been. Let me even go to the daily on it. Um, so these, these, you can see this green line that's gold. You can see that gold is potentially breaking out here, right? And it's potentially breaking out. And so if it does break out, then is it going to play out like it did over here in, you know, in 2019, where when it broke out, that's ultimately what marked the local top for Bitcoin USD. And if you were to go back and look at what it was doing, you know, what, what was gold doing back in 2015, 2016, right? Because we know back over there when ETH Bitcoin broke down, let me, let me zoom this back out to the weekly. We know that back in, in 2015, 2016, when ETH Bitcoin sort of broke down, gold back then was at around what, 700 or so, right around 700, um, $700. Let me go over to a, a different chart. Let me go here, here's the Bitcoin chart. So now we're gonna add gold so we can get a little bit more history on it because um, then it goes a little bit further back because we have Bitcoin on here instead of ETH, which has much shorter history. But if we pull it up like this and we go and look at, at what was going on back in, um, you know, what this sort of phase of 2016, what was gold doing here? What was going on with gold, right? You might argue that these were the range highs potentially, and then it rallied back up to it, but then it ultimately just got rejected, right? And then, and then you know, Bitcoin then rallied up from that, you know, that $600 level or so up to, you know, up to about a thousand or so. And during that time, gold was going down. So I think the answer or sort of the comparison to be made here is, you know, is gold breaking out? Because if, if gold is breaking out, then that would make you think it's more like 2019 potentially. But what if it gets rejected? Then potentially like the 2016 analog. So in that case, it, it's not entirely clear, right? It's not entirely clear. There's something else we can look at, and, and that's, um, you know, it's, it's monetary policy, right? It's just monetary policy. And if you were to look, again, this is ETH Bitcoin, right? If you were to look at, at, at interest rates on here, we can see that, you know, back over here, after the Fed paused, after the Fed paused rates right there, what ultimately happened, right? They paused right here. Bitcoin got a dip and then it basically went parabolic for a while. Same kind of thing, right? After the Fed paused right here, what happened? Bitcoin got a dip and then it's just gone parabolic for a while, right? But what ended up happening is that then Bitcoin topped out just before rate cuts arrived. And so that raises the question, well, are rate cuts going to arrive or are we just going to stay higher for longer, right? Like, are we going into an environment where everyone constantly thinks that the next rate cut is going to happen and then it just keeps not happening, right? People thought it was going to be March, probably not going to be March. Then it was May. Now, now the markets are already sort of counting May out. Is it going to be June? Is it going to be July? I don't know. Is it going to be this year, right? Who knows? The U.S. economy has been a lot more resilient than I think a lot of people thought it would be at this point in the cycle, right? And so it ultimately comes down to, you know, does something happen, right? Does something happen that causes the Fed to cut because they're likely not going to cut in an environment if inflation is not going durably back to 2% to their 2% objective. And so if they do cut in the next few months, it must mean that something is happening, right? That's causing them to want to cut. And so if you look at it like this, right, where you just simply get a lot of rate hikes and then a pause, right? A lot of rate hikes and then a pause. This would again look more similar to that 2019 rally than it would to say this one over here because back over here, I mean, yes, the Fed raised rates right there, but rates were basically just at, you know, what? 
50 basis points, 0.5%, right? Relatively low. Today, they're at 5.5%, right? So in that way, I, I would think it's more similar over here. And also, that was sort of just at the beginning of a massive rate hiking cycle um, compared to what we had had in recent years. You could already argue that this sort of whole rate hiking cycle that we've had back over there in comparison is this one. And so ideally, if we were to look at this from a, a, from a monetary policy point of view, I think it would make more sense to say it's similar to, to that one than it is to, to that one over there. But again, there's, there's no denying at all, right? There's simply no denying that there has been some interest coming back into the space, right? We also have the halving coming up in the not so distant future. Now I will say, in both cases where ETH Bitcoin broke down, right? In both cases where ETH Bitcoin broke down, it was on a Bitcoin rally, right? It was just that in this case, the rally continued, but in this case, the rally did not continue after ETH Bitcoin broke down. And so that's the question that I think a lot of people are should be asking themselves as well. If we think that ETH Bitcoin does break down to 0.03 to 0.04. And again, I'm not saying that it has to happen, right? I think it will happen and I've made my case for it. But if it does break down to 0.03 to 0.04, does Bitcoin USD continue the rally after that? Or does it fade? In 2016, the rally continued. In 2019, the rally faded, right? In 2016, gold got rejected. In 2019, gold broke out. In 2024, gold is at the breakout point, but I don't think anyone can say with confidence that it's really broken out just yet. I mean, just not that long ago, gold went into the 2100s or so and still came back down. So there is no guarantee just yet that gold's going to have that breakout. If it does, then it might imply a risk-off signal. But again, there simply is no guarantee that that happens. In the meantime, right, in the meantime, there is still liquidity in the altcoin market that I think has to make its way back over to Bitcoin, right? And, you know, one of the things that I've, I've talked about a lot this year and, and even last year, the end of last year, is that, if we were to follow the 2019 move, it would mean that Bitcoin stays risk on until 56% Bitcoin dominance, right? Now, at 56%, that will be sort of the decision point. Does Bitcoin continue the rally like 2016? Does it continue the rally? Or does it play out like 2019 where the rally fades at the 0.5 Fib retracement of Bitcoin dominance? And then Bitcoin USD comes back down as Bitcoin dominance then exceeds to 60%, right? And again, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, we've clearly talked more about 2019, um, but I'm here to show you now. I mean, there, there are other examples that we should look at, right? If you, if you exclude sort of the monetary policy outlook. And the reason why I'm showing those examples is because in some contexts, right, in terms of market cycle theory, it would be relevant to include those examples, right? If you were, again, if you were to look at the ROI after the lows, it would be relevant to use those in case Bitcoin continues to follow this track. So again, that is is, is a view that I, I think is, is somewhat worthwhile to talk about. There's something else that I, I think is relevant, and that is, again, the spot ETFs. Now, with the spot ETFs, you know, everyone wants to know, well, what's ultimately going to happen with it, right? Are they, are the flows going to continue? Are they going to sort of wane at any point? And at this point, at this point, um, we've seen Bitcoin get all the way back to near the prior highs. Now, a lot of people have compared it to the gold ETF. Um, and so I'm not going to, you know, to waste any more of your time comparing it to that. It seems like it's done, it's been done quite a bit. But one, rel this is sort of a more bullish comparison would be the looking at, at, at QQQ when that one was launched, right? When QQQ was launched, you can see that it actually got launched in, in 1999 and then QQQ rallied until basically a full year, right? So if Bitcoin were to follow, you know, QQQ and rally for a full year, that would mean all the way out until January of 2025, which if that were the case, if it were to top out then, 
then that certainly I, I would imagine will be considered a, a translated peak, <coughs> considering that a lot of the other peaks have occurred at the end of the post having years. And what's even more interesting, right, if you go back and, and you think about, you know, those price comparisons that we did to 2016 to today, what's more interesting is that QQQ ultimately was launched at around, right, if we zoom in here, if you really zoom in on that very first day, right here, QQQ, the low was around 49.66, the high was around 51, right? What's funny is Bitcoin hit around 48K the day that this spot ETF launched. Now, again, if it were to follow this, right, if it were to follow that move, if it launched at, say, 50, remember Bitcoin launched at around 50K, what the Qs did was they rallied all the way up to 120, right? So that would be akin to Bitcoin going north of six figures. But then what's kind of scary is that after that, the QQQ fell all the way down to 20 in a massive recession, right? In a massive recession. And so, I mean, you know, I, I think about, I think about that scenario, you know, if Bitcoin were to continue to sort of defy the, the, the sort of the macroeconomic landscape and just continue to rally into it, kind of like 1999. I mean, there are plenty of worrying things in 1999. It didn't stop the market from going up. Um, but that is something to think about, you know, what if you, you know, just imagine how that would be, right? If you, you know, all these people that they buy these spot ETFs and, and we get, you know, out of the halving year, we get to the post halving year where normally Bitcoin goes um, parabolic and everyone says, oh, the bull market's just getting started. And, and then it just collapses, takes out sort of the spot ETF launch lows and then goes all the way back down to, 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 to 20K, right? I mean, that's what essentially happened with the QQQs, right? And again, I mean, you might say, well, that QQQ was launched um, in, in a pre-election year, right? So there's a difference there. I mean, QQQ was launched it, today, if you were to equate it, it would, have been, it would have had to have been launched in, say, like March of 2023 for it to be an exact comparison. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, if you pull up the NASDAQ, right, if you pull up the NASDAQ, and we look at, at what the NASDAQ did back over here, right? The NASDAQ had a, had a pretty nasty drop in 1998, right? About a 29% drop, bottomed in October. Sounds kind of familiar, right? I mean, that's essentially what happened in 2022. Pretty nasty drop. And then it bottomed in October. And then... You know, the QQQ was launched like right here, right? So even though QQQ launched right here in March 99, it then <coughs> sort of led into that final blow off top for, the, for another year. Okay. So if we think about that for this cycle, though, right? If we think about that for this cycle, Bitcoin found the low in end of 2022, right? If it were following the tech bubble, or sorry, that was, yeah, if it were following the tech bubble sort of roadmap, then the spot ETF would have had to have been launched in March of 2023, which obviously did not happen because the, the dot-com era peaked in March of 2000, right? Which we're now in March of 2024, right? March of the election year, we're now in March of the election year. And so then the question is as well, you know, is it delayed by a year? Is it is it delayed by more? And I, I think one thing to think about is that this is only one example. Um, there's other examples as well that you can look at for, you know, for the stock market. Because while this one topped out in March, there's other examples of, you know, rallies during inverted yield curves where ultimately they topped out much later in the election year, right? I mean, um, in this case, we didn't top out, the S&P didn't top out until December of an election year. And in this case right here, it, it well, that case, it ultimately topped out in January of 73. In this case, it topped out in February of 66. Um, and, and then ultimately had this drop right here. So you basically had, this is sort of like your midterm year correction. And then you had a rally that then went all the way out until 
um, December of, of 1968, right? So just because the dot-com era peaked in March doesn't mean that every, every rally has to peak in March. You can see that this one ultimately peaked in December, um, although there was, you know, there was a little bit of a pullback in the summertime, but it ultimately went all the way out until December. And then there was one more example um, that was during the sort of this, this here, you can see that there was a rally in the election year and it ended in June, right? You might say, well, why are you comparing it to this one? This was also coming out of World War II. This was a period during high inflation. In this case, inflation, right? If we were to overlay the US inflation rate year over year, in this case, we had essentially a, a deflationary crash, right? So this is sort of the zero line right there we went deflationary. And when we went deflationary, the S&P crashed. And, and that peak in the election year occurred in the summer. But then over here, when we had a peak in the, in the, in the period where we had sort of a, a resurgence in inflation, right? We came, we saw inflation come back down to around 3%, um, which is, you know, where we are today. And then it ultimately rallied all the way back up the S&P topped out in, in December. So you have periods of high inflation, right? You have the 1940s, you have the 1970s. And we also have today, in the 1970s, we saw inflation surge back. The market did not peak until the end of the election year. In the 1940s, we saw inflation go to deflation and the market topped in the summer. And then in the dot-com crash, we saw inflation uh, we, we did. We we had some. We, we certainly had some level of inflation back over here. It wasn't as high as it, it didn't go as high initially, but I mean, it still was at around three and a half percent, which coincidentally is is not really that far off from where it is right now, right? It was around three and a half percent. But what ultimately happened is the market topped out in in March, right? So all sorts of examples that we can look at of of you know what ended up developing into a hard landing, but one peaked in December, one peaked in the summer of the election year, one peaked in March of the election year. <clears throat> so even if the analog of QQQ is sort of the blueprint, right, then, you know, what happens if this is what awaits us on the other side? I mean, that would be, that would be very painful. You know, that'd be very painful if, if something like that were to happen, because then, it, you know, maybe you go to that, that sort of that coveted level. Um, but I mean, after that level was hit, it took 16 years <laughs> to get back to it, right? I mean, that's a crazy long amount of you know, period of time for the Qs to get back to that level. And so that would be something to think about, right? So when you think about, you know, where ETH Bitcoin is, right? Where ETH, where, where the ETH Bitcoin valuation is right now, and we think about, you know, which way does it play out as it relates to Bitcoin USD? And I, and I overlaid those two comparisons, right? You have you know, you have, um, sorry, let me get a chart that has a little bit more history there. So you have the 2015, 2016 analog where Bitcoin continued to rally. And then you have the 20, you have the 2019 analog where Bitcoin topped. So again, here, ETH Bitcoin bottomed as Bitcoin USD hit around 900. So if ETH Bitcoin follows this analog and it comes down here, and then instead of Bitcoin topping, it continues to go up, then as it, uh, as it would approach six figures, that could be where ETH Bitcoin ultimately bottoms at 0.03 to 0.04. Now, what's fascinating to me is that while Bitcoin USD rallied in this example and and even and it did not rally in this example, ETH USD went down in both examples, right? So just imagine that, right? ETH USD in both examples went down, which is kind of crazy to think about, you know? I mean, I think a lot of people would assume that if 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 Bitcoin's going up, that means ETH is going up, but that was not the case over here, right? ETH dropped about 50% when ETH Bitcoin broke the lows. And so that's why I'm more, you know, cautious with Ethereum because it just seems like if and when ETH Bitcoin breaks down, ETH USD takes a big hit. 
and and then Bitcoin is either going to rally after it or it's going to top out and then slowly bleed like 2019. That is why I have said relentlessly that I think the best strategy, not financial advice, is to have a Bitcoin heavy crypto portfolio over an ETH heavy portfolio. And we've seen ETH Bitcoin bleed for a long time, right? We've seen it bleed for a long time. And so good chance that whether Bitcoin tops out at the time that ETH Bitcoin theoretically breaks down, ETH USD gets a big, takes a big hit. And I don't know what would cause that. It could be say the rejection of a spot ETF and maybe people just sort of divert their money over to Bitcoin because if the spot ETF is rejected, um, I don't know, right? I really don't know what exactly that would be, but that's just what the chart tells me, right? In, in both cases, when ETH Bitcoin broke, ETH USD dropped a lot. <clears throat> and what's fascinating, we talked about this order of magnitude stuff, right? What's fascinating is that ETH USD is following almost a carbon copy of its 2019 analog just multiplied by 10x, right? This low, right, this low right here was between 80 to 90. This low right here was between 800 to 900. Let me overlay the, sorry, the, um, the price label, right? 80 to 90, 800 to 900. And then we had a sort of the, the last level before we got a breakout, right? If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, if you look at, at sort of this trend, ETH USD was basically putting in these highs up against this trend line. But the last pullback before we broke above that trend was at about a 150. And there's a similar trend today, right? Where ETH USD was sort of struggling to break above this trend line. And the last pullback before it broke out was at 1500. And what's fascinating is that it ultimately topped out at 360. And we're currently at 3,400 and we already hit 3,500, right? So <clears throat> you can see where I'm going with this, right? I mean, ultimately what happened was that after ETH Bitcoin broke down, we saw ETH USD collapse back down to around 116, right? I mean, imagine if ETH USD were to collapse back down to those levels. Because again, ETH USD dropped in either case where ETH Bitcoin fell, right? Whether it was in, you know, whether it was the uh, 2015, 2016, or whether it was 2019. <clears throat> in both cases where ETH Bitcoin fell below support, ETH USD had a fairly massive drop. In 2019, Bitcoin topped as well. And over here, Bitcoin continued to rally for a while. So what do you notice though about ETH Bitcoin in this case, right? Look closely at, at ETH Bitcoin and how it relates, right? Look at this. Once the move came, it was, it was dramatic, right? Once ETH Bitcoin sort of fell below support, it was, I mean, it's always been dramatic, right? When it falls below, right? It just, it then bleeds for like three months straight, right? It did it right there and then it did it right here. I don't know if it's going to be on a, on a sort of a sustained Bitcoin rally or if it would be on, on something different, right? Or, or, a, or a Bitcoin sort of fade, right? If it's a Bitcoin fade, then it implies that retail is not coming back. What if retail does come back, right? So that's ultimately the question that I, I think we have to ask ourselves as well. Is retail going to come back? And again, they might, but they haven't yet. If you look at the social risk, it's currently at 0.279, right? It's still kind of where it was in 2019, in fact, right? I mean, like 2019, we saw the social risk was never really durably able to break through 0.3, right? It got above it some, but it never got through it. We've done the same thing over here. So if we're going to emulate anything like what happened over here with the Qs or what happened in, you know, 2016, then retail has to come back because if they don't come back, then, you know, how do we see that play out? There's other things we can look at too. Um, there's the, the fear and greed index. 
And again, it's one of those things where like you could make the case either way. You know, I mean, if you get if you look at at just sort of the raw values in 2019, by the way, we did a, a video on fear and greed index just recently. Um, it's now up to 83. Remember in 2019, once it hit it, once it went into the 90s, that marked the top. But in 2021, when it went into the 90s, it Bitcoin continued to rally 3x, right? It rallied 3x after that. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's really hard to say, you know, if it's going to follow that 2019 move where it tops in the 90s immediately, or if it follows the 2021 move where it continues to expand for a while, even after the fear and greed index goes into the 90s. Um, so, I mean, again, like there's there's definitely similarities, I think, for, for both cases. Um, I honestly, and I, I, I will try to reiterate this as frequently as I can, I don't know which one will ultimately play out. I think it's good to be hedged either way. Again, for me, that just means having a, a Bitcoin heavy portfolio because it gives me exposure to the potential upside while minimizing my downside risk. And again, one of the things to consider, normally <coughs> when ETH Bitcoin breaks down, it's on a Bitcoin rally, right? And, and I've said that many times, right? My ultimate expectation is that Bitcoin rallies um, you know, these rallies continue, it stays risk on until we hit 56% Bitcoin dominance, right? Until we hit that 56% level. And you can see back over here, that level to break through, we got to get through 55%. We've come up to it a few times. And I think we will ultimately break through, right? I mean, I really do think that the dominance will eventually break through to 56%. But remember, when it broke through previously, right? When it broke through previously, it was on a Bitcoin rally, right? We had a wick here. And then another wick right there kind of looks somewhat similar, right? A wick there, a wick back up. We had a pullback that lasted for a few weeks. And then we rallied back up and dominance went absolutely crazy. So my expectation is that dominance will rally back up and break through this. And it could happen sometime around the halving. This wick right here occurred in May and then it broke through in June. This week that we just got occurred late February. So maybe we see Bitcoin dominance break through this either in late March or April. If you look at Bitcoin dominance on the monthly, you will see that there's been a fairly consistent pattern, right? Where it moves up a couple of months, you know, one or two months and then pulls back a little bit, right? It's not out of the ordinary for it to do that. And it's doing it again. And so that's just something to keep in mind that that liquidity you're seeing go back into the altcoin market where Bitcoin dominance has fallen back in, it implies that eventually that liquidity will make its way back over to Bitcoin. Now you might say, well, Ben, what about all these people telling me about, about alt season and, and the collapse of Bitcoin dominance to 30% or something? Well, I will just simply humbly remind people that <coughs> the last cycle Dominance did not top until QE returned, right? It wasn't until QE returned that dominance topped, right? Where the Fed started to expand their balance sheet. That's what marked the top by Bitcoin dominance. And as long as this thing's going down, like it was over there, I, I think that Bitcoin dominance will continue to go up. So whenever you see these rallies by the altcoin market during QT and during high interest rates, it implies that, well, that liquidity at some point in the future will likely make its way back over to Bitcoin. And at some point, Bitcoin will likely break the altcoin market down on their Bitcoin support levels. If you don't know what I mean, just go look at total three minus USDT divided by Bitcoin. I think we're emulating that same sort of that same thing, right? Where there was these lows at around 40%, you know, alt Bitcoin pairs were around 40% over there. And then eventually they broke down. <coughs> In 2019, that's what marks the top. So again, you know, I know that I've I've said a lot. I, I've said a lot of times that in 2019, that's what marks the top for Bitcoin USD. When alt Bitcoin pairs broke down, 2016 would have a word about that. It would say, well, yes, ETH Bitcoin broke down then. Bitcoin still went up for a little while. So for me, how do I handle it? I, I you know, it's hard for me to stress about it every single day. I don't really want to do that. I just want to say, hey, I just think Bitcoin heavy is the way to go um, until, you know, until we get to looser monetary policy. That's my view, you know, and that's been my view for basically the last two and a half years, Bitcoin heavy crypto portfolio until looser monetary policy arrives. And 
even when loose monetary policy arrives, it doesn't mean that you immediately have to go into altcoins. If loose monetary policy arrives because we are in the middle of a recession, then you probably wouldn't want to make the conversion to altcoins. If you get a switch to loose monetary policy and we don't have a recession, then it would make more sense, right? But it all depends on, on when does the Fed ultimately pivot. And, and one thing that I'll say that really throws a question mark into all this stuff is that, you know, we do have an inverted yield curve which we haven't had with the exception of 2019 for in cryptos history you know i mean yes there was a brief inversion here in 2019 and we had a a recession in 2020 but for the most part we haven't really had that so this here you know has to make you wonder is is all this comparison to these prior cycles is pointless you know i mean what if it does just completely play out um, in a you know in a different way and 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 arguably it's this that has continued to lead to us being kind of ahead of where we are or where we were in prior cycles. We remember earlier on in the video we showed ROI from the low, ROI from the peak. We're ahead in all these cases, and I think the reason, frankly, is because a lot of people are worried about potentially going into a hard landing, and so the market just keeps on climbing the wall of worry. It pulls these people in, and so by the time the market finally <laughs> rolls over whenever that is, I imagine it will have tried to pull in as many people as possible, right? And then from that level, you you know, you know likely get a, a hard landing. Again, I mean, it's hard to go against the data, frankly. You know, I think the biggest question mark is, is when does it occur? You know, because you could get a hard landing from 60K that takes Bitcoin back down to the lows, or like the Qs, the, you know, the QQQ showed us in 1999 when it rallied all the way up into <coughs> um, 2000, where it rallied from 50 to 120 and then all the way back down to 20. So think about that. Like think about that, what we mean for Bitcoin, right? If, if Bitcoin went from 50 to one, 120 K all the way back down to 20 K. So, you know, there's a decent chance that a hard landing eventually occurs. It's just a matter of when does it occur? All right, I mean, if you go look at, at any labor market metric, with the exception of the only thing that matters, which is the unemployment rate, which hasn't moved, if you look at most of these unemployment rate metrics that are these, these labor market metrics, like new hires, they're just dropping, you know? And that's something that I, you know, when I look at, you know, when I look at, at the Bitcoin chart, <laughs> and I say, well, is it going to play out like, 2016 is it going to play out like 2019 and I, I just simply like ask myself well let me just look at hires total non-farm hires in all of bitcoin's history hires have just gone up all of bitcoin's history it has just gone up except for the you know the, the the pandemic but i mean again like it was a it was a black swan it was a fluke i don't really think we can make any strong comparisons it's just gone up <coughs> This is clearly a, a change in the trend. I mean, is it not? It's clearly a change in the trend. So maybe that's, you know, I mean, it will, maybe that's what's happening, right? We're just climbing the wall of worry. We talked about this before. What are the two things that can, can keep us from climbing the wall of worry? We talked about a lot with the stock market. There's two things. Either inflation reaccelerates or the labor market collapses. We have not yet seen inflation reaccelerate. We've seen it remain sticky. You know, I know some people say, well, it's accelerated. It hasn't really accelerated. I mean, it's just been, it's basically just hasn't gone anywhere in, in half a year. You know, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at the inflation rate year over year and say that it's accelerated, right? It just hasn't moved, right? So until you either see inflation reaccelerate or the labor market collapse, we climb the wall of worry. And so the question is, is how long is that? You know, and, and again, that's sort of the, the big question to sort of think about. And if you look at, at, say, like the ROI to low after yield curve inversion of a lot of metrics, right? If you look at, at the S&P ROI to low after inversion of the 10-year, month 10 -year, three month yield, we've exceeded all prior cycles by a lot, you know? But at one point, at one point, <coughs> the dot-com, or sorry, the financial crisis had exceeded all prior all prior cases, right? So it's really hard to say. I mean, like, 
you know, you, you can look at, at, at this example there, the financial crisis, you can look at the dot-com crash, and then you can look at, at today and say, well, we've exceeded that, and maybe we do continue to exceed it for a while. You can see that in the financial crisis, the yellow dot represents yield curve uninversion or the uninversion of this metric. We still haven't even seen that yet. Right now in the dot com crash, we were already in a, you know, in a massive bear market when that occurred. So I look at things like that and I think, well, you know, are there other things that we can look at? And, and I can go over here and look at, at various metrics that we can compare to in the macro verse and say, well, you know, what were things doing back then? Right. What were average hours worked per week? Some crazy metric like that. <clears throat> this is where we are in this cycle, in the 2022 cycle, the one you know where we saw the inversion of the yield curve back then. So I mean, like, we're kind of worse than the financial crisis in terms of our average hours worked per week. If we want to look at something that can include more cycles, because that one hasn't been tracked as long. Um, if we were to go look at, I don't know, um, what's something that we could we could look at. Uh, maybe maybe um, continued claims, right? Continued claims might be worthwhile to look at. If you look at, and I'm going to get rid of the pandemic one, right? If you look at continued claims, you can kind of see that we're, we're we're doing what we always do. I mean, like, this is what we do, right? This is the current cycle. Here is financial crisis cycle. Here's dot com, which just went down. Um, <coughs> here is 1974. Let me reset the zoom here. Some of these, it, the the yield curve just didn't stay inverted very long, and it's sort of like a um, an algorithmic issue the way it's being calculated. But you know, here's the the 1981 to 1987 continued claims. You can see that it was just going up. And so on and so forth, right? But I mean, when you look at all of them, right? When you look at all of them with the exclusion of the pandemic, it's kind of what we always do with continued claims, right? I mean, they just go up and they're going up <coughs> slowly but surely. You know, they are. And you can look at other things. I don't know what else. There's some things that just look completely weird. Um, even even inflation, I mean, like, even if you were to look at inflation, still is not that different, you know, um, in, in some ways. I guess, I mean, I guess it has, <clears throat> I, I guess it has gone up since, yeah, this is the, this, this was from the 10-year, the three-month yield curve inversion, um, which, when did that, that was, that was later on in 2022, right? Because um, the, the, the two-year inverted the 10-year in the summer of 2022, I believe. But anyways, I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of different things that we could look at. Um, one, one of the fun ones is, is M2, because M, M2 is, is in all other cycles, it just kept going up. Like, this is the cycle where it just keeps collapsing, you know? Um, so that one's kind of different. But um, And there's some that look even strong. I mean, like, I, I'm sure I could find ones that look strong. Uh, for instance... Um, um, actually, I just saw this one. This one's actually another weak one. There's plenty of strong ones like net saving. Uh, where is net saving? So yeah, I mean, like, look at this. Like, look, look at the current cycle. I mean, net saving has just fallen off a cliff compared to these other cycles following yield curve inversion. Um, but there's some strong ones. Let me find some strong ones on here. Like GDP has been pretty strong. <coughs> um, this is a 2022 cycle, right? It's still still positive. Um. If we were to look at, at say, I don't know. What are some other good ones? There's the smooth recession probabilities. Let me get rid of that one. We're still really low right now for 2022, right? It's barely off the ground. Let me look at a few more. Job openings, not a lot of cycles to compare to, but here's at least the last couple. Kind of see where, yeah, I mean, that, that's just what it's doing, right? I mean, like, it, it, there's there's a lot of things to look at and say, well, yeah, like, there's probably going to be a hard landing at some point. 
but I don't know when that's going to be exactly. Um, and I don't know if, you know, if Bitcoin will, will just top out the minute that alt Bitcoin pairs break down, um, which is what it did in 2019, or if it'll continue to rally like it did in 2016. I imagine it will depend largely on if the Fed breaks something between now and then, right? If the unemployment rate goes up, that's probably a good one to look at. Maybe that one, the obvious one, right? The unemployment rate. Some of you guys are probably screaming at the screen, like, why don't you just look at the unemployment rate, right? So here's the unemployment rate getting into these cycles, right? I mean, we're this is a lot of times cycles are at this point, the unemployment rate. I mean, I know it's low, but so what? It's often low at this point. Here's the, uh, the financial crisis. I mean, we're actually ahead of the financial crisis. But you can see that the financial crisis unemployment rate really didn't start to really pick up. <coughs> so we're in month 14. It didn't really start to pick up until month like 21, right? So another seven months from now, right? Which would be Q4, the end of the year. So there's a lot of things that we can look at. And, you know, I, I do, I mean, just to be completely honest with everyone, I mean, like, I, I feel like after last year, I've been struggling to really be bold about it. Because, I mean, last year, my view was that Bitcoin would spend half the year going up and half the year going down. And I was wrong. And I was spectacularly wrong about that. Um, and I, I mean, I can at least tell you why I thought it. And I mean, I, I won't be, you know, using that stuff again to make claims like that. But I mean, again, like, I, I feel like I have to learn from these mistakes. I mean, you know, I looked at, at 2015 and I said, look, about half the months are red, half the months are green. 2011, half the months were red, half the months were green, approximately. 2019, half the months were red, half the months were green. These were all pre-having years, right? We went up half the time, we went down half the time. So I thought in 2023, we might do the same thing. 2023 was both basically just green the whole year, right? For three red months, it was green the whole year. So I feel like, you know, I feel like after that, I, I, I said that I didn't think Bitcoin would go above 35K in, in 2023. And, and that was a mistake. I mean, I said that at the beginning of the year when Bitcoin was at like 20K, um, I said I thought 35K would mark the, t the high for 2023, and clearly that was wrong, right? We went, on, we went much higher than 35K. Um, I mean, even by October, I mean, I was, even, I was still right on that prediction even through really through November. I mean, or through the end of October. It wasn't until November arrived, right? So I made it to the 11th month of the year. And then I was spectacularly wrong, right? And I will be spectacularly wrong many times if you watch this channel. I mean, I will be. Um, but that's what happened. And I mean, again, like, you know, when, when you put out a prediction like that and then it exceeds it, it's hard to get back on. I mean, it's hard to then just say, well, this is what I think is going to happen because everyone's like, well, you, you already thought that and you were wrong. So... Why should we care? And again, I, I'm actually sympathetic to that view. Why should you? Um, so that's why I, I, I think it's it's good to have a plan, you know. And and I've said before, I mean, you know, my whole strategy um, is just to buy according to the risk levels, right? And, and that's why while I talk about all these different outcomes, all I do is buy and sell according to the risk levels, right? So if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, these are the risk levels. And so at low risk, I buy Bitcoin, and at high risk, I sell Bitcoin. I'm not someone that is just gonna hold Bitcoin forever, although I do have a, a HODL stack. I'm not the guy that's just never gonna sell any of it. I will sell it when it goes to high risk levels. And so <coughs> what that's meant so far, if you're curious, um, has been buying some over here. Again, I've, I've had people say, you know, why didn't you tell me you were buying? Well, I did. I mean, there was plenty of episodes of, of those live streams where people asked me what I was buying, and I just said, well, just Bitcoin, not altcoins. Guys, I've missed out on some altcoins gain, altcoin gains for sure. My, my, my reasoning for it was that I thought Bitcoin dominance would go up, and I admitted back then that some altcoins would outperform Bitcoin, but that Bitcoin would likely lead, and the dominance would go up. The dominance has gone up. Some altcoins have outperformed Bitcoin in a spectacular way. That was my view. That's why I only bought Bitcoin. I did not buy ETH. I did not buy any of these altcoins. I bought Bitcoin and that was it because I thought Bitcoin dominance would go up. And it has, right? Bitcoin dominance has gone up, right? 
I'd like to think that I can look at that and be like, all right, made the right decision. But yeah, I mean, any one of you could point to like 10 different altcoins and say, well, you would have made a lot more money had you bought that. Yeah, that's true. There's also a little bit of survivorship bias in there, but it's true. And I said back then, some would outperform. <coughs> but with that said, um, you know, I bought over here some. Could I have bought more? Yeah, could have bought a lot more. I wish I had, but I didn't, right? I bought some. Um, but my crypto portfolio, as I've stated, is like just 99% Bitcoin. Um, I do have a few altcoins, but but none that I bought this cycle. They were just sort of relics from prior cycles. Um, and then after buying over here, the risk levels did not really call for me to sell any there, there, or there. But here, they called for selling the way that I navigated one tenth of the Bitcoin stack right there in the 40s. Now, I mean, you can look at it and laugh and say, well, now we're at the 60s. So don't you wish you had it all? Um, sure, right? But again, there's no way to know where the top is, right? There's no way to know where the top is. And also, even though even though that was what the risk levels called for, selling one tenth into the spot ETF launch, even though that is what the risk levels called for, after this peak, we had a twenty percent drop, and on ITC Premium, I said, "There's there's a there's a note at at thirty nine k." I said, "If you sold one tenth, like you know, like the like the risk levels called for in my strategy." in this range up here, then now that the risk levels have come back down to 39K, it would potentially warrant picking it back up if you feel light on your Bitcoin stack. And so it did allow for that. I'm not really sure it was worth the tax situation. <coughs> Probably depends on where you live. Um, but it just it, it's just one thing. So that's what the risk levels are for, right? It, it's basically saying like, all right, you know, you buy over here, you you basically do nothing over here. You know, you just do nothing. And then once it starts to get heated, then you start to sell some, right? Um, and so, you know, I mean, if we go into the 0.7 to 0.8 risk ban, I'd probably sell some more, right? But it, it would only be like, you know, two tenths. Um, and we're currently at, at 0.68 risk. But I mean, it does, it does just kind of show, you know, how the risk levels work because the, the whole idea is I don't know where Bitcoin's going to top. But I want to make sure that I take profits along the way because once it does top and then it starts to go back down, everyone who is sort of, you know, diamond hands, they just get made fun of for two years, right? I mean, so yes, you can hold forever if you want. Um, and, and honestly, there's a good chance that'll eventually work out. But there's examples where hard landings occur and... That would have been very detrimental. Again, going back to the cues. If if that scenario plays out, again, I don't know if it will. <coughs> but if that scenario plays out, it still doesn't mean you can't break below the uh, the the spot ETF launch area, right? This one broke below it, and it was a terrible bear market, right? Terrible bear market, and also that occurred after an inverted yield curve. So that's why I keep going back to this idea. I mean, I know this whole inverted yield curve stuff has been going on forever, but remember the main risk, the main recession risk is on the other side of the inverted yield curve, right? It's upon the uninversion, right? It's upon the uninversion. And so in ITC premium, when we started this year to try to get myself back on track, I was like, all right, well, you know, my base case right now is that Bitcoin remains risk on until approximately 56% dominance. And so far that's been an okay view to have, right? I mean, the market has continued to go up. We haven't hit 56% dominance yet. When we do hit 56% dominance, assuming that we do, it'll be time to see, is retail coming back? Can Bitcoin sustain this rally past 60K? Kind of like 2016, when it broke through 600, it went to 1,000. Can it do it like that? And then ETH Bitcoin breaks down as Bitcoin goes parabolic? Or... Does it play out like the monetary policy analog of 2019, where after Bitcoin finally breaks ETH Bitcoin off support, then Bitcoin finally fades and drops 50%, right? And, you know, even for the people that like to use the 2016 analog, remember that after breaking 
out of these ranges, it would then come back down and test it as support. The problem now for Bitcoin is that this range there at 30K to drop from this level here is about a 50% drop, right? Well, a 50% drop is exactly what we got in 2019 after it broke, after ETH Bitcoin broke down. So what happens if ETH Bitcoin breaks down and then Bitcoin drops 50%, right? You could have something like that, right? ETH Bitcoin breaks down, Bitcoin then drops 50% back down to, to this level. The problem that I have, right? The, the, the thing that I keep going back to and, and, and thinking about <coughs> is there's a lot of smart people out there, um, a lot smarter than me, in fact, um, that, you know, they've been bullish at various times. And I, I've seen more and more of these guys flip bearish, right? You know, the, 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 there's been a lot of people that have been very bullish. They were, they were more bullish than I was in 2023 because I thought the highest it would go would be uh, 35K. But there were some people out there calling for 40K and they were right. You know, and then there was some people this year calling for, you know, 50K and they were right. And then they flip bearish, right? They flip bearish here at the uh, the launch of the spot ETF. And then now you got us at the range highs and now more people are flipping bearish. And the problem is that anyone who flips bearish, right, is getting mocked to oblivion because Bitcoin just keeps on going up, right? And they just get mocked to oblivion. I think the issue is that, you know, Bitcoin's not really building out any real support, right? I mean, a lot of times when you have these longer bull markets, after it breaks out, it likes to test it as support. Once it gets to the point where it's not testing it as support anymore, and it just goes into these like sort of these blow off tops, that's when you get these nasty bear markets to follow. So basically all the people that were sort of screaming for pullbacks throughout this entire phase, all of them eventually get vindicated, right? But it just takes a long time for that to play out. So yes, I've seen more and more people have flipped from being bullish to bearish and, you know, calling for pullbacks and, and all that stuff. And, you know, Bitcoin just keeps on going up. I, I sometimes look at like the NASDAQ over here. And I'm like, think about, think about how many times people must have called for pullbacks over here throughout this entire rally. And then eventually this is what happened, right? So because it never really built out support, once the market finally turned, it just, it took everyone out, it took everyone out with it. Um, and in this case, it actually took out the low from the midterm year, right? But it didn't take out that low until 2002. So four years later, right? It was four years later <coughs> that it took out that low. And so, you know, as, as far as it relates to Bitcoin, you know, with this low right here, if there's a hard landing, and, and, you know, we get a, a left translated cycle, which I know is, is a, a view that's sort of going around right now. What happens? You know, does it play out like similar economic business cycles where you get these rallies into all this yield curve inversion stuff? Eventually, the labor market cracks and the whole thing comes crumbling down over the next two years. Maybe that's what happens. Um, but until then, I mean, uh, it's, all, it's all about how long will the party last? And again, you know, there's this, there's this thing that, and I've said this many times, is that uh, Warren Buffett said, and the reality is, is he's probably smarter than, uh, at least much better investor than for sure me, and probably most people, if not everyone watching this video, is with a, sort of the, the, the idea is we're all at a party and everyone's going to turn into uh, pumpkins and mice, I believe, at midnight, right? But you can avoid being turned into a pumpkin if you in or mouse, right? If you leave the party before midnight. So then everyone's like, oh hell, we'll just all leave the party before midnight, right? Makes sense. Easy, right? Everyone just leaves the party before the clock strikes midnight. So everyone thinks they're gonna leave, right? The problem is there's not a clock on the wall. And so people keep dancing and having a good time thinking it's only 7 p.m. when it's actually 11.59, right? And so I think that's sort of the the, the issue is that <coughs> we don't know. We don't know what time it is. We don't know if it's 11, if it's 12, right? Is the, is the clock going to strike, strike midnight next month? Or maybe it's only 8 p.m. and we still have months and months to go. No one knows, right? But what you see and what you'll probably continue to see as, as, rally, as the rally continues, assuming that it does, is that more of these people will slowly flip bearish, right? The people that have been bullish. And then at some point, 
um, you know, as, as people sort of slowly leave and they get mocked, right, but then eventually the clock, the clock strikes midnight and anyone who's still there gets turned into a pumpkin, right? And the people that sort of left early, um, while they're mocked for a while, they're then eventually, <coughs> um, you know, sort of vindicated. That doesn't mean that you're ever going to, you know, that doesn't mean that you have to ever go take out this love, right? I mean, you could, but it doesn't mean you have to. Um, you know, if, if it, the, the queues basically went up to 120 and then went back to 20. Um, so again, you know, it, a lot of what it, a lot of this sort of boils down to will retail return. And it, and it kind of just goes back to these charts we were talking about at the beginning of the video, right? Like new Twitter followers to various analysts on Twitter kind of goes back to like this kind of stuff. <coughs> will they return? Or will it be a 2019 repeat where everyone thinks they're going to return and then they just never return? Right? There's the, um, maybe the last thing I'll mention and then I should go. There's this other idea of this Fib retracement stuff. One thing to note is that in 2020, this started to go parabolic after we broke new highs, right? So Bitcoin is closing in on new highs. So if retail is going to return, then I imagine Bitcoin needs to break new highs, okay? So if you look at, at this stuff, you might say, well, where is retail? They didn't really show up last time until Bitcoin broke new highs. Bitcoin hasn't broken new highs yet. So maybe that's why they haven't shown up. We're still below 69K. Will we break above it? If you look at the last cycle, if you look at this cycle over here, we went up to the 618. Now we've already gone to the 786 and above. But what's interesting, and I've, I've been watching, the, I'm, I'm going to keep watching this one closely. What's interesting, if you look at ETH Bitcoin, <coughs> and you remember guys that, that double peak stuff we were talking about earlier? If you look at the FIB retracement on that, it retraced between the 786 and the 1, right? But it didn't make a new high was the issue, right? It didn't actually make a new high, but it retraced back to the 786 to the 1, right? Somewhere in between. Um, and so that's ultimately the question. Everyone keeps saying, well, retail is definitely coming back. Guys, if we make new highs and the spot ETF stuff just keeps on growing, then yes, retail could return for sure. Even despite you know a, a weakening labor market, right? And maybe that's maybe that's how brutal it could be is that people get laid off. Their last hope is to just become you know some investor in a re really risky asset class, and then they get decimated there too. Um, but I, I do think at this point we haven't seen retail come back in any durable way because Bitcoin's not at a new high. ETH Bitcoin came close to making a new high but it topped out between the 786 and the FIB and the one FIB retracement. Bitcoin USD is between the 786 and the one. That doesn't mean that even if it tops out in this range, it doesn't mean that this has to be the top. Remember, Bitcoin typically rallies until all Bitcoin pairs break down, until ETH Bitcoin breaks down. Last cycle in 2019, Bitcoin rallied for a, a full extra week after gold broke out. So gold potentially starting to break out last week not really confirmed yet. We'll see if we confirm it this week. But even even last cycle, Bitcoin still rallied even after gold finished its um, even its breakout, and it, Bitcoin rallied for another week or so. So again, I, I would look to see that does the Bitcoin rally top out in this range, like ETH Bitcoin did, <coughs> or does it make a new high? If it makes a new high. Then we go back to this chart and say, all right, well, now is retail coming back? And maybe that's where they come back. That's what I'm looking at, right? What's your uh, dubious speculation on Bitcoin? And I imagine a lot of people are looking at this and like, well, why don't you just tell me if it's going to go up or down? Guys, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. I, I, I think that it's worthwhile to have a plan either way, right? Having some Bitcoin gives you exposure to the upside especially if you're bullish on Bitcoin dominance like me. Having some cash 
in, er in earning the risk-free rate can be worthwhile if we get a hard landing. And who knows? Maybe the hard landing starts soon. Maybe it starts a year from now. <coughs> I don't know. But I do think that, that it's worthwhile to be hedged for both outcomes. Um, and then I know people, you know, I've seen, I've seen people already trolling me again about the Bitcoin dominance. So what I find fascinating is that, you know, it just slowly grinds higher. Anytime it gets a pullback, everyone likes to say, well, you know, look at that. Ben was wrong. But I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I look at this and I, I think like, well, you know, maybe it's just kind of back testing. Right. Kind of faked it out above right there, but maybe it's just back testing that. One thing to keep in mind with Bitcoin dominance is that when Bitcoin USD, if you look at Bitcoin USD, you see here it went up and then it consolidated. During that consolidation, Bitcoin dominance went down. Then it just went up again and now it's consolidating. During that consolidation, Bitcoin dominance is going down. So if there is another rotation into Bitcoin USD and Bitcoin runs the highs, you know, the upper 60s, that is where Bitcoin dominance should break above this range high here, go to 56%. And at 56%, that's where we say, is it like 2019 where that marks the top? <coughs> or does it rally to new highs? We see retail come back in, get sucked in into some parabolic rally like the QQQs in 1999, only they didn't get a hard landing after that. I don't know. I don't know. But that's what I'm looking at. I do think Bitcoin dominance, the most confident thing I'm on right now I do think Bitcoin dominance will continue to break out. I do think it'll go to 56% probably in the next couple of months or so. And then from there, it should be a pretty quick move to 60%, whether it's on a Bitcoin rally or on a Bitcoin faith. So whether it follows 2019 or whether it follows 2016, Bitcoin dominance, once it hits 56%, should get to 60% You know, within a few months after that, right? It shouldn't take that much longer to get to 60% after that 56% level is achieved. And again, there's an example where that was during a Bitcoin rally. And there's an example where that was during a Bitcoin dump. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up. And again, check out the sale on Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.